Okay, we are live now with my good friend, Coach Kevin Wardlaw. Is that how I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, man, you did it well. <laughs> Kevin, please introduce yourself and tell uh, what city are you on? Yeah, I'm, in, I'm just outside of Kansas City um, at a school, Mid-America Nazarene University. I've uh, been here 17 years, so quite a while. And One of uh, the top schools in the NAIA, right? Yeah, we've done well, man. We've been very blessed. Uh, some really good teams over the years and incredible guys. And it's just, uh, it's a good school, a good place to be. And Kevin, you're telling me right before I go on live that uh, you have three daughters. How is that affecting yeah. them? Yeah, it's been crazy to watch. I've got three teenage daughters and, you know, obviously with this shutdown and everything, it's really disrupted their lives. Um, I've got a senior in high school. And so it's, that's been a really sad thing to watch her have to, have her senior year kind of ripped away. Um, I just, I vividly remember that as a, as a kid, my last semester of my senior year was incredible. And uh, so I've, I've really been feeling for her and some of the other seniors. Are you coaching them soccer at home? <laughs> no, we, uh, so I actually run a club on the side as well. And so I started a youth club, Toka FC about eight years ago. Um, and so we've got about six, a little over 600 kids in the club. And so my daughter, two of my daughters play in that club. And uh, during the shutdown, we've gone to kind of virtual learning, virtual coaching. So our staff is doing an incredible job, really, really thinking outside the box, being creative with all the different technology that's available. And so my two of my daughters have had an opportunity to do that. And that's been really cool. So how is that working for you? Do you uh, have your coach go online through an app and then give the technical or a fitness training to them? Yeah. Yeah. So our coaches meet with our kids twice a week. Um, the first one is kind of an individual setting. Um, it may be like a one on one, just check in how they doing, you know, see how life's affecting them. Do a little bit of accountability there with what the skills and some of the different things they've been working on. Uh, the second one is a group setting. And so they're literally almost doing kind of what we do in college where we bring our teams in and we do video sessions. Um, our coaches are doing video sessions with the group and depending on the age, of course, the video session varies from maybe a tactical session that's very similar to what you might do in college all the way down to, you know, a little group session with nine year olds where you're showing professional players doing skills and how those skills apply to games so they understand why they're working on them. Fair enough. So Kansas City also has been in lockdown for yeah. about a couple of weeks now. Yeah, yeah, we were we were fairly early to go into lockdown, which ends up being a good thing. Um, and so we'll remain there through the month of April as well. Um, and so, yeah, it's just it's been interesting, man, to watch. It feels like it's been forever. And honestly, we're just scratching the surface of it now, just here in the first week of May or sorry, April. And how did it affect your spring season? Like uh, talking about college soccer, your team in school, you stopped training at all and just doing online. Is school has gone online, classes are going online. Yeah, yeah. So we went all online this week. Um, so players are getting used to that. We're also, our players at, uh, at MNU are doing similar things. They're actually doing four, we're doing four workouts a week. Uh, one workout is with the entire group together on a platform like Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Um, and then they meet in small group uh, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And then we get back together on Thursdays as a group and we don't do any training. We just talk, um, just catch up on life. Um, kind of, We've got players from all over the world. So we just find out, you know, what, what's what's happening in their countries, what's happening in their cities. And, and, and then it just gives them a chance to connect, maybe ask questions about, you know, maybe they're having some issues with classes because now it's a completely online and hopefully just a place where we can stay connected as we try to make the best of this situation. Do you think this is something that you could carry on through this summer, for instance, uh, like the online classes and the online training sessions, the online talking, meeting, which could be something good out of it, right? Yeah, I think that's the thing I've been challenged personally about as we went through this. And as you know, obviously, as we've started to realize how serious this was, is uh, life gives you 
mountains and it gives you valleys. And I think our job is to find opportunity within each one of those things. And I think my challenge has been, what's the opportunity that we can find in these moments? Um, and I, I still think we don't know what this is going to do. I think our lives have potentially been changed forever from this. I think we're going to do some things differently after this is all over. Um, and some of it may be what you just stated. I think online and, and doing video sessions and staying connected with different platforms that utilize technology is going to be a way that we do things from now on. Um, and it's been, a, it's funny because it's been available to us, but it takes something like this to where we're forced into it. And all of a sudden you see people reconnecting. I mean, my neighborhood has more people outside walking and jogging and running than I've ever seen. Uh, and I think some of it might be that this is going to allow us to hit reset on life in a lot of the different aspects, family, our jobs, the things we put priorities on. Um, and so I do think what you said is correct. I think we'll see some things evolve from this that we'll look back and go, man, why did we do that? And then we realize it started in this moment. As, as far as my experience here, like we have a crazy day during uh, before, you know, just on a regular uh, daily basis that we work so much, we travel, we are always busy. And now we're having time to stay with the family. So it's yeah. it's giving us totally different perspective from like things, little things. We're eating together now. We're having lunch yeah. together, which was really difficult during, you know, the, the normal days. So as, as you said, I think there's always something good to take out of it. But uh, moving on to, we have only 15 minutes to talk. We have, uh, I'd like to talk to you about college soccer in general. Yeah. Uh, do you see a possibility that the season, the soccer season spe specifically could go all year long? Yeah, for sure. Uh, obviously that's been being talked about at the division one level for a few years now. And, and I guess up until this, situation with COVID-19, you know, that was going to come to a vote. Um, MNU is an NAI school, and I actually served on the executive committee for the for the coaches for five years. Um, and so got involved on the administration side of things quite a bit. And, um, and so even in the NAI, we've had a committee that's been studying what would it look like to go year round. Um, and obviously, you know, if we're, we're all hoping, I think, those of us that believe that that's the right thing is that if the division one model can be approved, uh, it might give us a bit of momentum to follow suit. Um, but do you think NAIA has to follow and wait any suitable way or could do it by itself? Yeah, that's why we put the committee together is, you know, in a perfect world, we would say, listen, let's be the leaders, right? Let's, let's have the NAI be the first one to do it and move forward with it. But, Again, I think NCAA is facing the same thing that we will face, which is this is so against tradition. Um, there's no, there's no, you know, there's no manual for this to go year round in a sport in an inter intercollegiate, you know, kind of concept is just unheard of. And so a lot of it is just getting administrators to understand that just because we've been doing things one way for so long, it doesn't mean it's right. Yeah. Change sometimes is hard because it breaks us away from the norm, but change can be incredibly positive. And in this case here, if we could take games and, and go once a week, make it safer and more uh, sustainable for the players, um, I think, you know, development wise, it's a no brainer. You, soccer players want to play soccer. It's what I tell yeah. administrators all the time. And uh, I was looking at the numbers as well. I graduated from NNA school in 2008, Fresno Pacific, which was yeah. NNA, became NCAA. And back then I was drafted to go on and play professional. Right. So I was looking at the numbers that players that can go on and get drafted, and the numbers are less than 2%. The college right. players in general, NAIA, NCAA, they're less than 2% to sign a professional contract. And do you think because the season is too short could be a big factor that they don't develop as much as a player who could play uh, summer league and play in the spring could develop like maybe a player who is in another country uh, playing all year long not going to school for instance then he has a better chance to sign a professional contract does it make sense yeah i think so i i think there's a part of that that i would agree with it's hard to project that because we've never been in that um but there's no argument that developing players over the course of 10 months 
would be better for them in the long run. But it's also, I think, a tribute to the professional system in the United States. It keeps getting better. So it's harder to play in the level. It keeps getting better. Correct. So it's harder to play in the United States than it was 10 years ago because you have to be that much better. And even though we've expanded the professional ranks to two or three tiers, uh, there's more players now. And so, and then there's a certain aspect too, and we can't get into it here, but there's a certain aspect of professional. The reason professional players are one and 2%, there's a lot to do with just pure God given genetics, right? You, you can't turn a donkey into a thoroughbred horse. It doesn't work. Right. And so there is a certain section of the players who play who, irregardless of what, how we developed them, they would never be professionals. And that's absolutely OK. That's why the sport exists for those that are incredibly talented all the way to those that just love to kick a ball and, and run around a field. Uh, and I think that's the beauty of this game is that it encompasses all aspects of genetics and different backgrounds and journeys and everything. But on the other side, have you ever seen a player uh, doing really well in NAIA that you could see that he could go professionally, but because of not playing so much or not having a chance to go on and, and play, he missed out on opportunity? Yeah, for sure. I've had players, many players that played for me that I felt like had the opportunity or had the gifts, I would say, the gifts to play professionally. Some of them had the gifts, but they didn't have the right mentality, though. Right. And so that mentality of a professional is incredibly different as well. And, and you know that because you experienced it as a great player and obviously with a great mentality, you found your way. Um, so I've seen all of that. The other thing, too, specifically in the United States is um, the limit on international roster spots. And that that really forces the kids that say are internationals who have the talent to play professionally in this country to then go outside of this country and find a place to play. And that can that can be a large sacrifice. And so some yeah. kids just aren't willing to make that sacrifice because now they're moving into a family life or maybe they're they're wanting to pursue their professional career with their education. And that's okay too. So I think all of these factors attribute to the less than 2% of what you're stating. Yeah, and uh, just one other question that uh, before we finish it up, as far as the international students, you have a lot of international students, in your school and your team, uh, the economy with this whole coronavirus situation is going totally uh, unpredictable, as right. we can say. At least here in South America, we see the dollar fluctuating a lot against the Brazilian money and the other right. currencies here in South America. Do you think the schools would be willing to uh, give a better scholarship to South America in this case or a better financial aid or something like that? Yeah, I think that probably depends on the scholarship system that you're in. Every school has, uh, you know, we all have similar scholarship systems, but there's little nuances within each one. Um, and I think depending on the scholarship system, there's room for those adjustments that could, could be made for an individual who's facing, you know, a, a bad economy, if you will. Um, in other scholarship systems, yeah, that may be very, very tough. It may, the coaches may be very limited in how much they can actually help in those situations. Um, but it, I mean, it's a great question. And I know, you know, we've had Brazilian players uh, in the past and we will again next year. And I know that, you know, specifically South America, uh, you know, with being the dollar versus the REI is it's, yeah, it's changed a lot just in the last nine months. Yeah, it has changed a lot. And uh, anything that you want to uh, address to the international players that are looking for a school that were affected directly on the recruiting process that a lot of coaches can't do any recruiting, a lot of coaches have, uh, coach have done the recruiting, and they may, they, the students, they may be out of school. They could not have a chance to go to school right now. Yeah. Yeah, I would just always say if it's if this is the dream that you have, um, you just have to really be diligent and be dedicated to pursuing this dream. Is this situation going to hurt some of that? Yes. Uh, I've already had some of my international recruits tell me they're going to wait for a year until they see what this thing looks like a year from now. And that's absolutely OK as well. But I've also had a, a lot of kids who are incredibly dedicated and now they're responding to emails they're responding to our text messages yeah. and they're getting after it. So, so on NAIA, you you don't have a rule that you can't recruit right now, right? You you still uh, can recruit correct. because in, during NCAA you can't recruit during this time officially. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, NAI, of course, you know, we're not doing any visits on campus or anything like that, but we're using, you know, WhatsApp and text messaging and emailing to make sure that we get, you know, our recruits taken care of and that we continue to talk with those that we had identified. All right, Kevin, our 15 minutes are up. It was a great yeah. talk, great uh, small talk. I know if it's always about college soccer, soccer in general, we could be talking for uh, over an hour here. Yeah. Thank you so much. I hope your family yeah. uh, goes well during the process Thank and you. good luck during the season. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. We'll see you later. All right, Kevin, bye. All right.